Okay, this is for my third hour class on uh, April the 7th. You may have missed a little bit of the lecture because I just remembered to turn on this recording device. But anyway, you can get your notes from another classmate. Uh, anyway, uh, the fact is, is that uh, Marx died. He died, I think, uh, in, in the, he died in the 1880s. And there, even though he had predicted a great communist revolution, it never happened. If I just said to you the communists took over Russia and you don't have a clue of what, as to what communism is, that wouldn't mean much. So now maybe you know a little bit about the founder of communism, Karl Marx, and what he wrote and his system. So that'll take us to World War I. Get this down. And, uh, and Russia, okay? Uh, in 1914, when World War I started, get this down, in 1914 when World War I started, uh, Russia, get this down, Russia had been an absolute monarchy. That means they were ruled by a king and he had all the power. Write that down, an absolute monarchy for 600 years. Listen, for 600 years. And Russia was ruled by a dynasty. In other words, a royal family. And the name of the royal family, the dynastic name, get this down, was the Romanov family. Okay, the Romanov family. And the Romanovs had ruled Russia for 300 years. Okay, so they had an absolute, they didn't have elections. Uh, you know, they didn't have assemblies. They didn't uh, write, you know, the, the, the ruler of Russia ran the country. And the title of the rulers of Russia, they were the czars. Okay, get that down, the czar. Or you can spell it this way if you want to. The czar or czar. Okay. And you're looking right here, right? Get all this down. This man right up on the board, Nicholas II. Nicholas Romanov II was, when World War I broke out, World War I broke out, Nicholas was the czar of Russia. He was the ruler of Russia. Okay? Uh, and he's the last czar. There's another picture of him. He's the last czar of Russia. He was married... To this woman right here, uh, get this down. She was the Tsarina, the queen of Russia. This is the king. This is the queen of Russia, the Tsarina. And her name was Alexandra. Her name was Alexandra. You know, a lot of times these royals marry people they don't love. They just want to produce an heir. They want to produce a son to take their place when they die. And as soon as the, their wife, uh, the woman they marry, uh, as soon as she produces a son for them, they go their merry way and they live with their mistresses and all and have all sorts of illegitimate children. They don't really love their wives. They and their wives just come together on formal occasions. But these two loved each other. You know, if you're the kind that likes a, 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 a real love story, then pick up a book about Nicholas and Alexandra. They loved each other, okay? And uh, the czar, get this down, the czar, and about, uh, oh, I've left out something too, this little boy right here, uh, Alexei, this little boy was his son, of course, and when the czar died, this boy would take over. So the future of Russia is riding on this little boy. So you had the czar, and you had the czarina, and you had the little Zarovich, okay? Write that down, the Zarovich. You know, it sort of warms your heart to think of the Tsar sitting in the royal palace and looking down the hall and saying, get over here, you little Zarovich, okay? But <laughs> the little Zarovich, okay? There he was, a little rascal. And he was the, the next ruler of all of Russia. By the way, if you rule Russia, talk about real estate, look at this. If you rule Russia, you rule quite a bit of territory, all that orange across the globe. And that little boy was next in line to rule it. This man ruled it. By the way, people that knew, he's not the brightest guy in the world. People who knew him and met him for 20 minutes, one of the things that all of them came out saying, he couldn't stop picking his nose. Okay, the whole time he, they were there talking to him, the czar was picking his nose. That's just a, just a habit he had, I guess. Anyway, well, anyway, got this down. The czar and his family and their relatives, the nobility of Russia, lived in great wealth and splendor. Uh, they lived in great palaces. Here is one, there's one of the czar summer homes. I think that had 1,100 rooms in it, I think. That, that's just one of his palaces. It's still over there. You can, go, you can go see it. The front yard of that, the front yard of that 
was 800 acres, okay? That's the front yard. And he had peasants out there. They didn't have a riding lawnmower. Uh, they were cutting it by hand, okay? 800 acres. But that's, uh, they even built him a big pool out there with a bottom on it that he could bring his yacht. They could put his yacht on a train and they could bring it all the way here to this in the suburb and then just slide it off and they could float around in this pool. And pick. periodically they would drain it because the czar wanted the water clear when he looked, he wanted to see the bottom and he, they would have the peasants scrub it, okay, and clean and then they would fill it up with water and put the boat back in. <clears throat> there's one of the dining rooms in it, <clears throat> okay, there's one of the dining rooms. So that's pretty fancy schmancy. And get this down, about the czar and about 10% of the people of Russia lived that way, right there, 10%. The nobles, the upper class, the kind of, Marx would have called them the bourgeois. Those are the people are talking about. The people who have the wealth, they live like that. About 90%, get this down though, but about 90% of the population were peasants, okay? Peasants. Peasants. About 90% were peasants. And here's how you spell peasant. Or if you prefer, you, you can call them a serf. Not serfs up, or, you know, students have this habit of writing pheasants. I'm not talking about that bird you go shoot up in Kansas. I'm not saying pheasants. I'm saying peasants. If somebody would write, the pheasants were working in the field. I'd like to see that. Or the pheasants were plowing in the field. It's peasants. And about 90% of the people of Russia live like that. And they were illiterate. They couldn't read and write. They were deeply religious. They were very superstitious. Get this down. They love the czar. You know, he, they, you know, they're eating dirt. He's up there in the palace eating caviar. I don't know if dirt sounds better to me. I don't know who would eat caviar. But uh, anyway, the czar is living in great splendor, and they're eating dirt. But they love the czar because they believe, get this down, that the czar had been sent by God to protect them. God had placed Nicholas Romanov on the throne to protect them. And their life was hard. Look at that right there. there there's a little peasant hut. You know, in the winter in Russia, you know, they have severe winters. It's nothing in Russia for it to get 60 below zero. Think about that. You know, we had a little snowstorm here a couple of weeks ago and let out the whole state shut down. So just think about this. 60 degrees below zero. And these Russian peasants would go in this, these huts. They would bring their animals in with them. Uh, to generate more heat. Uh, and every winter, hard as they worked, every winter they would run out of food, and before the winter was over, they would have to go out. That's thatch. You know, you, you know what thatch is? A straw roof? Yeah, thatch. You heard of that before? Well, now you have thatch. They would go out with hooks in the middle of the winter because they'd run out of food, and they would pull down thatch. They would pull down straw, and they would feed that to their animals, and they would eat it too. So the czars living in the palace, waited on hand and foot, uh, eating caviar off of silver plates. These people are eating hay. You know, it's like if you went home today and said, gee, mom, what's for supper? And she said, oh, we're having a, you know, a bale of alfalfa. Uh, that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that, that's what these people were, uh, were living through, okay? But they still supported the czar because they believed that the czar uh, had been sent by God to protect them, okay? Well... Uh, the czar, this Nicholas became the czar in 1894, uh, and he and his wife, get this down, had four daughters in a row. There they are, four daughters. And, of course, every time the Tsarina would get pregnant, the people of Russia would just be praying on their hands and knees, oh, God, send us a son. We don't want a Tsarina. We want a czar. When the czar dies, we want his place taken by a czar. And then they would have a daughter and another daughter and another daughter and another daughter. You know, people thought, people thought that a, that a woman couldn't handle it. If a woman becomes a Tsarina, she'll buckle under the pressure. The whole state will go to hell in a handbasket. Apparently they hadn't read their Russian history because the strongest ruler Russia ever had uh, was a woman named uh, Catherine the Great. You know, not very many people got the, 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 the words the Great attached to their name in history, but she did. Uh, she made generals pee on themselves. You know, the, the, she was ferocious. Uh, so this idea that a woman couldn't handle it was just baloney. But that's what they thought. Uh, and they prayed and prayed and prayed and were disappointed. But get this down. In 1907, 
the year that Oklahoma became a state, in 1907, that little boy was born. There's the czar and his son. Looks just fine. That's, that's him when he's about eight, I think. Future czar. <clears throat> What's the first surgery you ever have in your life? And every one of you have had it. Hmm? Yes. As soon as you exit the birth canal, there's somebody there with a big, you don't remember this, but there's someone there with a big old pair of scissors. You've got a tube running from your stomach, and that's how your mother's body feeds you for nine months in the womb. Okay? And as soon as you come out, they cut that. And it bleeds. And they put a clamp on it. And they wrap you up and put you in a maternity ward and various parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents come and press their face in this in there and go, uh, uh, you know, it's one of everybody getting an axe murderer. <laughs> and a nurse will come by a couple of hours later and they'll take the clip off and it's stopped. Well, okay, and then they'll come back a few days later and that umbilical cord has fallen off. And by the way, you have a constant reminder that you had that surgery. What is it? Huh? Yes, the navel. Okay, your navel. Every one of you's got one. Clamp that. Next day, it's stop leaving. And the nurse will come and she'll be changing you. <clears throat> and looking, there'll be something about that long that looks like a piece of rotted grapefruit vine. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that's that umbilical. It's falling off. And then you go on and turn into what you are just right now. That surgery hurts somebody. But anyway, that's another thing. You, know, you, you live happily ever after. <clears throat> well, this little boy, they cut the up and all. And listen, when they announce it's a boy, all across Russia, people are dancing in the streets, church bells are ringing. People are so happy. We finally have a future czar. God has blessed Russia. And they clip that umbilical cord, umbilical, and they put a clamp on it, and they come back a couple of hours later, and they take it off, and drip, drip, drip. they put it back on. The next day they come, and they take it, drip, 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 drip. They put it on, and the next day it's drip, drip, and to the much to their heart. You know, this grand national celebration turns into national mourning because the little boy uh, had a disease called, you know, here they said, our prayers have been answered and, and in the, have been answered. And in the midst of their celebrating, the little boy had a disease called hemophilia. <clears throat> you have, unless you are a hemophilia, hemophiliac, excuse me, you have platelets in your blood. If I nick myself shot and shave this morning, if I nick, I will in the morning, and if I nick myself shaving, uh, I can just do that, work that for about this long and, pull it and stop. Because I've got platelets in my blood. And if there's a break in my epidermis, those platelets, just like an army, stop the bleeding. This little boy didn't have that. Hemophiliacs don't have that. Now today, with the advance of med listen, with the advance of medical science. Uh, you know, there are treatments and medicines for hemophiliacs, and hemophiliacs can lead a very near normal life today, okay? But none of that was true in 1907. Uh, the, you know, that was all still in the future. So get this down. The best kept secret in all of Russia becomes the fact that this little boy is a hemophiliac. And by the way, here's just a little information about him. By the way, hemophilia plays a major role in the coming of the Russian Revolution. And hemophilia is called, get this down, the disease, I think this is the way you'll see it on the test, the disease that toppled an empire. The disease that brought down an empire. Hemophilia. By the way, women carry the hemophilia gem, uh, uh, gem, uh, gene. Not gem, gene. Men don't carry it. It's transmitted from the female to the male. There aren't very many female hemophilia. Goes from the woman to the man. Thanks, ladies. Thanks. Okay. And by the way, Alexandra, Alexandra was, listen, was the granddaughter. You remember Queen Victoria of England? She had four daughters. All four daughters married into the European household. One married into the Germans, one the Austrians, one the Russians, and maybe one the Spanish. I don't know. But her four daughters, and they were all carriers. She was a carrier of hemophilia. 
uh, the hemophilia gene. She didn't have it, but she was carrying the gene. She had a son named Leopold. You know what the national sport of Europe is? They call it football. We call it soccer. And when Leopold, I think, was in his 20s, he's the, one of the sons of Queen Victoria. He's out playing, and a ball hit him in the head. Every one of us had been hit in the head by a ball, playing dodgeball or soccer. And it killed him. Okay? He was in his 20s, killed him. And her four daughters married into the royal households of Europe, and they all married European and she go she's the granddaughter of queen victoria and she infected him and she never forgave herself never forgave herself never forgave herself uh, when it is announced that that little boy has hemophilia she shut herself up in a prayer closet and prayed night and day her hair literally turned white while she prayed it was such a stressful situation Okay. By the way, here's something else. You don't have to write this down, but but uh, look, all these people, not these people, but all these people are descended from Queen Victoria. Okay. So you understand this: the Tsar of Russia and the King of England are fighting against the Kaiser of Germany, right? They're all cousins. They're all the. By the way, this takes place in Europe, not Arkansas, but they're all cousins. Okay. <laughs> I just want to say. This, this took place in St. St. Petersburg, not Little Rock. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and always somebody says, Well, gee, grandma, don't you want me to lighten up on a grandma is go get her and bring her out. <laughs> bring her over here. Anyway. All through, you know, Wilhelm II, you know, the guy who's trying to destroy England, he was Queen Victoria's favorite grandson. Yeah. So anyway. <clears throat> this little boy's a hemophiliac. Well, in 1912, get this down. The family went on vacation. You don't have to write this down, but they went to Poland. And the little boy, like a little boy, was out playing. You know, he would look, he looked, look at him. He, well, where did he go? He looked perfectly healthy. But he couldn't have a bicycle. He stamped his foot and said to his dad, he said, I'm next in line to be the ruler of Russia, and I'm the only boy in Russia that can't have a bicycle. When he went out to play, he was never outside of his bodyguards. When he went out to play, they wrapped thick pads around the trees and walls and removed all the rocks for him to go play. Because if he fell, you know, if you're a hemophiliac, now today there is medication that makes this better, but if you're a hemophiliac, that right there could be life-threatening. And by the way, your skin doesn't break and blood doesn't gush out. You bleed internally. You just don't, you're, you, you have nothing to stop that. If you didn't have platelets, if you got a good bruise on your arm or your leg or your foot, you could die from that because the blood just keeps flowing inside. It doesn't come out and it will flow until your skin is pulled so tight that it can't flow anymore. And then over a period of days or weeks, it will be slowly reabsorbed back in. He fell one time. Uh, hit the back of his leg, and the swelling was the size of a large grapefruit on the back of his And all they could do was lay him on his back, prop his leg up, and watch that skin just get tighter and tighter. And when it got so tight, then the blood started to reabsorb back in, and eventually the swelling went down. He didn't walk for the next six months from that one episode. So, that's hemophilia. So, he's... <clears throat> He's playing out in the yard, playing out on vacation, and the Tsarina is out there, her chair watching, kind of reading a book, and he fell. And she ran to him, and she could see the black spots. It's like you get a bruise. She could see the black spots starting to appear on him. And she panicked, and she grabbed him, and she ran toward the carriage, jumped in the carriage with him, tells the driver of the carriage to lash the horses, and they head for the palace uh, where they were staying. And, of course, every bump he hits, another black spot. When he got to the palace, by the time they got there, he was dying. Uh, he was so close to death that they called in a priest to give him the last rites, R-I-T-E-S, the last rites. You know what I'm talking about, the last rites? Are any of you Catholic? Anybody, is there a Catholic in the house? One, get a rubber. No, uh, <laughs> any of you Catholic? Well, I was raised in the Catholic. I'm, I'm, I'm a Republican now, but I was raised in the Catholic tradition. You've never heard of the last rites? Yes. Okay, so what is it? 
it's like whenever you're gonna die, a priest is like, do you have anything that you want to confess or whatever? Or yeah. Like, so he's a child, so, he's, so I don't know what they're having. Well, hey, no, I hit my little sister. <laughs> I hit my sister. Yeah. yeah. According to the Christian religion, when you die, I'm gonna do this just real quick. When you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. Can Christians go to heaven? Uh, can Christians go to hell? Yeah. No. No. What's the whole point? What's the whole point of Christianity? To do what? To go to heaven. Yeah, and if you're a Christian, you know, the Bible doesn't teach if you're a Christian, you're going to hell. Sorry about that. Uh, but, you know, if you're not a Christian when you die, according to the Bible, you're going to hell. If you're a Christian, you're going to heaven. But the Catholic Church, which is the largest Christian church in the world, the lo most Christians are Roman Catholics. The Catholic Church teaches that if you die with an, if you're a Christian and you're on your way to heaven and you die with an unconfessed sin, it would be like if I were a Christian and I grabbed my briefcase today at the end of school, I was in a hurry and I ran out of here and I got to the stairs and I fell and fell all the way down the stairs and broke my neck and died. But just before I died, I went, damn it, uh, because, uh, you know, it was profanity. Uh, I wouldn't have time to confess. And so what would happen to me? I died with an unconfessed sin. So what would happen to me? Huh? No, I can't go to hell because I'm a Christian. What's the matter with you? Uh, yeah, you can't. I can't go to hell. So, so where, where do I go? Huh? You go to a little place in the middle here called purgatory, and you stay in purgatory until you've paid for that unconfessed sin. And as soon as you've paid for that unconfessed sin, up to heaven you go. Okay. Huh? What? Don't pack up. We're not done yet. Just hold your horses. No, it's you mean if Dante started that? I thought no, he he, he talked to you know, yeah, but it's, no, he didn't, he didn't, you know, that's the doctor of the church long before he went through this or a friend. But anyway, back to this. So that's what that's what it is. And a, a dying Christian will call a priest to hear their last confession. So they don't have to go to purgatory, they can go to heaven. Now, you've all seen gangster movies, haven't you? I'm talking about back in the 20s and 30s and gangsters, you know, and some guy named Guido gets shot and he's laying there dying and all of his fellow gangsters are gathered around him and they say, Guido, is there anything I can do for you? And he'll look up through clenched teeth and he'll go, get a priest. He wants to confess his path. Anything you want to confess was. Yeah, yeah. He'll, he, he, he wants to confess so he can go straight to heaven. Well, my point is, after all that explanation, this little boy was so sick, they called a priest to give him the last rites. Okay? He was clearly dying. But get this down real quick. We're not done yet. He didn't die. Huh? Well, he doesn't. But uh, he's dying, and the, and the Tsarina is just weeping and beside herself. And there was a maid in the room. All these doctors and nurses, there was a maid in the room. And she told the Tsarina this. She said, my sister lives in St. Petersburg, and there's a holy man that showed up in St. Petersburg. He can cure disease, and he's literally resurrected dead corpses. Well, of course, if, if, if you had said that, if you had said that in normal times, they'd have said, get that quack out of here. He's an idiot. But desperate times call for desperate measures. And she said, who is it? And she, he, uh, Grigori, write this guy down. Grigori Rasputin. Yes. Grigori Rasputin. Okay. No, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Okay, Rasputin. That's yeah. So they put in a phone call to St. Petersburg, and they go down in the slums of St. Petersburg and get him and bring him to the royal palace. And there, on the end of the phone, is this crying, yelling woman. And finally, you know, Rasputin just sort of listens, and uh, finally she stops to take a breath, and Rasputin said to her. <clears throat> Don't let the doctors bother him. The little boy will live. Click. Well, the little boy lived, and from that moment on, get it, I'll explain this further, but get this down. From that moment on, the Tsarina thought that the life of her son, meaning the life of Russia, was in the hands of who? There's the grass mute. And so, anyway, your testament out of that. Study it all. Rasputin. Well, I'll tell you all about it. I'll tell you all about it. Do you what? 
You think you have enough time? Yeah. I don't remember where I saw it, but I thought that, like, since he told the doctors not to bother them, they didn't give him some medicine that would have killed him. Well, if, I don't, and that it was like a, it was just very convenient coincidence, and it just made him. Yeah, work. well, you know, uh, what I've heard read is that, you know, the doctors were poking a prod and turning him, and then didn't give that blood time to set up and start to reabsorbing him. They did clear the doctors out of the room, and when they stopped turning him and poking him, that probably. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please don't make one now. Juniors will be taking a science and history state testing on Tuesday, April 12th. You all will need to be in your designated classroom at 8 p.m. Rosters are posted on Google Classroom. You must have your school issued Chromebook fully charged. 
bring your own approved calculator if you so choose if you choose to do so. Phones, smartwatches, etc. will not be allowed. Students that would like to meet with a representative from Connor State College for concurrent enrollment for the 22-23 school year need to read the important information posted in Google Classroom on April 1st. For those of you that have packets from KTC, you have to have those turned in no later than tomorrow. Now, Mrs. Grant needs to see all juniors with their School issued Chromebook in the auditorium at this time. Thank you. Building, please go to the library at this time. Cole will. 